Good morning again. Well, it's raining. It looks really bad on the radar, but it's kind of a light drizzle at this point, and we haven't really gotten anything. So, uh, no field work today, but we've got plenty to do. And we've got some parts in our little parts shed, so we're going to take these up. So, what those parts were this bundle and the stuff in here, and some stuff I got the other day. Our new vacuum doors, seals, and knockout wheels. So when we were doing the plot on Friday, um, I was changing these over and we changed these scrapers to go from the bean plates to these knockout wheels for the corn plates. But these little screws here are stripped out. Well, not really, let me show you. So we were able to get the knockout wheels that were in there, these, out and put the scrapers in as we needed them um, but then when I was trying to change them back I noticed that let's see if I can show you focus so there is a little nut like molded into the plastic that that screw screws into it's in this little tab here and it's spinning in there and I can't get the screw to twist out and I need it to twist out far enough to get on this thicker plastic base from the knockout wheels. Couldn't change them. So I just ran them with the scrapers in there because it's not the end of the world, but it's not right. And uh, there was probably four or five of them that were doing that to me. So I called them to get new doors because Obviously that is the problem, so I needed some new doors and screws. We just replaced all these two. Over the winter, these were all brand new. Um, they have updated them. They no longer sell this style of door with that little molded plastic uh, uh, nut in there that you screw these things into. They now sell this style. And this style has this little, oh, let me take it out of there. So now we have this style where they have these two tabs and clips here and this thing no longer has a hole for a screw. Instead, it hooks in there and snaps into place. Better, yes, good, great, fine. But now I have all of those other ones that we just bought that I can't use and there's nothing I can do to make them work. So yeah, so anyway, I got half a dozen of these and we're gonna replace the ones that I couldn't get back the way they're supposed to be. All right, well, there was four of them that we replaced. I don't know what Dad's doing, getting the forklift out. Um, all right, so the next thing we're gonna work on on this planner here is um, we've got this new GPS receiver mast. This is to put a GPS receiver on the planner. I'll explain why we wanna do that later. Right now, we're gonna figure out how to install it. So this bracket is going to mount on the front of this platform here. Um, these two bolts and those two bolts. Problem, that rate controller that we just added, those bolts are gonna be in the way. So we're either gonna have to drill all the way through this and put longer bolts in there or find somewhere else to mount that or potentially I could spin those bolts around, put the, uh, or if I could put a pan head bolt on there. Probably not, so I have square holes. I don't know. We're going to figure something else out there. Well, we've decided to go with the drill holes all the way through it method and we'll have to find some long bolts to go all the way through this and that other thing to hold that uh, rate controller up. So, drilling. Okay, well, we've got our, uh, our mast up there. And uh, I am waiting on a wire harness yet, so I don't have the wire harness to connect to the GPS receiver. So we're not actually gonna put the GPS receiver up there because it does me no good. The other thing we need to do is remount this rate controller. It hangs under there. I just need some longer bolts and uh, the John Deere dealer has them. And I know you don't need to go to a John Deere dealer to get bolts, but I don't have any in the drawer that are the right size and that will work. And I could go to the hardware store, but they don't have flange head bolts and I want flange head bolts and the deer dealer will bring them to me literally in two hours faster than I could go and get them anywhere else. So that's what I did. It's four bolts. Dad has been waiting for a rainy day for a long time so that he can start sawing up logs. Now I just uh, finally getting around to stuff here. And he's got a basswood log on there. He's going to make two by fours out of, I believe, framing lumber. 
Okay, so we got that thing installed and Dad's uh, sawing up some logs. We'll go check in with him again later. But uh, Brock and I are gonna head down to the seed warehouse. We're gonna fold up a bunch of those empty boxes and clean some of that stuff up. And Brock just says to me, so is this the kind of rain that you really like after planting? And he's right, it is. It is a nice, slow, steady, even rain. It is not a pounding, hard rain that's packing the crap out of the ground and gonna make it crust over. It's just a nice, gentle one. This is not a bad thing. Um, would would we prefer to dry out and finish planting? Absolutely, yes, 100%. But if you're gonna get rain, this is the kind of rain that we wanna have. Um, 20 degrees warmer would also be good. That's coming next week. We're supposed to be in the 70s and 80s and sunnies. Sunnies? Sunny. <laughs> and so I think that, um, I think we'll be good. It's just, we just gotta wait a week. Well, we're making riveting content here. Um, Brock's pulling some of our labels and stuff off and I'm going around pulling lids and flipping these little levers. Those are the locks that hold the top half to the bottom half. And once we get done with some of that, then we flip the top over and it slides down on the bottom half. You wanna watch? Here, watch. Okay, watch. Ready, Brock? Up, oh, top, and flip, got it? Once that's done, then we can stack them all up. You can get twice as many on a truck, return truck, doing it this way, so that's why we have to flip them all. And plus, they don't take up as much room to store them. So we're gonna do that to all of these. Obviously, we gotta unstack those other ones, and then we're gonna stuff them over there in the corner, move that one box, and just make a pile. All right, what was the last thing we filmed, Brock? Flipping boxes? I think so. All right. I don't think you did me cutting tree. I did not. Well, we came back to the farm here. Brock cut up some chain for the drag on our field cultivator, but it's raining, so we're not gonna install that today. We got them ready to go. You greased the planter, right? I did, yep. It's a rainy day. We're going to lunch. That's and we're okay. Because why not? So Brock and I are on our way back from uh, lunch in Rural King and he got a call about a fire that's right on Territorial Road, right on our way home and we're just pulling up to it. He's, he's going to be on scene first, or pretty darn close to it. So we're heading, I see lots of smoke, but we haven't found the fire just yet. And we got flames, I did see them, where are they? Still up here a little ways. That's a big fire. Have fun, Brock. Yeah, we're gonna be uh, working a little bit. I'll, I'll pick up my car sometime. Yeah, yeah, we'll get you. If you need me to come pick you up at the station or something, yeah, call me. Yeah, we'll have maybe. And then we got flashing lights, or a uh, 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 civilian. Fire, big one. Brock's before all the trucks. I did good, man. <sighs> That's a bad one. Cattle, propane tanks, what they said on the thing, I don't know. But I'm out of here, because there ain't nothing I can do. Here comes the uh, first fire truck. There's no water out here, so they gotta tank everything in, and they gotta, they gotta have fun. Not good, not good. It probably took us uh, maybe five minutes from the time he got that call, until we were on scene there. Uh, here goes another fire truck. We beat both of them there. Beat the first one by a minute or two, and that one by a couple of minutes. But hopefully they can get that put out, and no, none of the livestock uh, are still in the barn because that barn's gone. We are more than a couple of miles from there, more than like five miles, and this is the fifth fire truck that we have passed. And. Uh, uh, an ambulance or rescue vehicle, I guess. I don't know, but yeah, they're on their way. All right, well, we're back. Thought I'd come see how Dad was doing. Check it out. We got some nice two by fours. Very good. And uh, check that out. See that pile? That is a garage door. Overhead door. They're getting ready to install that. So that's awesome. 
my bolts came to, so oh, we can finish this project up. All right, those are the four bolts that we needed. Is they hold uh, this black bracket on in the front there. Ugh. That holds our uh, rate controller down underneath the platform here. Anyway, that is done, so now we can mount a GPS receiver and on there. Now, why would we want a GPS receiver on our plant? Well, here's why. So, um, because we have a drawn planter, meaning that there is a tongue and a pivot point behind the tractor, it can drift. It can move side to side independent from the tractor. Specifically, it does this when we're turning on curves, planting on a slight curve, or on hillsides where it might kind of gravity drag down the hill. By putting a GPS receiver on the planter, um, it will talk to the tractor and it can compensate for that drift and keep the planter exactly where it's supposed to be, not just the tractor exactly where it's supposed to be. So it'll help keep our guest row spacing a little bit more even, especially in curves and hillside situations. The other big thing and the reason that we did this, um, well, part of the reason that we did it, I guess, is it will allow us to uh, use what John Deere has called AutoPath. And what that is, is where it will record where the planter runs every single planter pass that we make with this installed. And uh, then when I come back to side dress, spray, if we had a Gen 4 monitor in the sprayer, uh, harvest, it will use the auto, it will create an auto steer path to follow in exactly those rows. Whether I hand steer it or we use auto steer and the planter drifts, it will know exactly where the planter was. And then we can auto steer on that exact same path the rest of the year and use those so we're not driving on the roads. So that's a really cool thing and we are gonna use that. Um, the thing that made it possible is that all I had to do was buy that mount and the wire harness. Uh, when we bought this tractor, it came with a built-in GPS receiver, which means that I have an extra one. And if you know anything about GPS receivers and stuff in the, at the moment in the industry, they're impossible to get. You cannot find them. It is a luxury to have an extra one even just to have enough for all the tractors and stuff that we are using is really nice because a lot of people would love to get their hands on them they're selling for double what they're worth i thought about selling it but i can use it there's chances that i'll need it in the fall uh in just different situations where it's going to be nice to have and we already have it so rather than getting rid of it uh, i'm going to utilize it and all i had to do was buy a, a receiver mount or yeah uh, um, the, the mast there and a wire harness and I can do all this cool stuff with our corn planter so that's why now the wire harness is back ordered and um, hoping to get it in the next week or two I don't know if we'll have it before we're done planting corn or not if not then well then we'll use it next year but that was the idea uh, apparently we're not getting a door today but they dropped it off and left so maybe tomorrow they're coming to put the door in. I don't know. Don't know. Hey, look, it's Brock. Did you get it put out? Yeah, put out. Are you okay? Tired. You look like you're warm. You wearing a coat. You know, it's cold out. A little, a little warm. A little close to the fire or what? No. We lost a pig and a cow. Oh man. But no people. No. No propane tanks exploded. No. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. All right, well, Brock just got back from the fire there, but it's 4 o'clock. He had to leave anyway, so um, I am down here in the seed warehouse. We've got five boxes of beans to treat. I'm going to go ahead and run them through here real fast, and then I'm done with what I know I need to treat. I still got some beans over there in that corner that could be treated if they get sold, but right now they're just stock extra beans in case somebody needs something. So, um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do these. It won't take me very long. I'm just trying to figure out chemicals get it all mixed up i think i'm gonna drain another keg and have to open another one which what are you gonna do but that's why i have them all right since it's a bit of a slow day and it's been quite a while since i have talked about seed treating and what we're doing and really shown it and i've had quite a few new subscribers in the last couple of weeks i'm gonna go real quick over what we're doing here i did it when we started but i'll do it again now that we're wrapping it up so we are treating soybean seed so the soybeans come to me in these big plastic boxes and they look like this. Just like soybeans, just like what we harvest. They're clean, they're seed quality, I guess, or grade or whatever you want to call it, but they have no uh, what we call seed treatment on them. 
when they come to me. And so what we are doing is adding the seed treatment. The seed treatment is a uh, combination of fungicides, insecticides, colorant, um, designed to protect the seed and seedling as it is growing. We are using Cruiser Max Vibrance. The Cruiser in Cruiser Max Vibrance is the insecticide, it's thiomethoxin. And then there are three different fungicides that are in there. Methanoxum, Fluidinoxinol, and Sedaxin. We add a little bit extra of the apron component, the methanoxum, um, just to give it a, a little bit more power against some of the diseases that we fight the most here in Northwest Ohio, Southern Michigan. And uh, I am adding yellow colorant to the Cruiser Max Vibrance to turn them orange instead of red. Just a branding thing. The seed, once treated, has to be colored an unnatural color. Doesn't matter what color, just it can't look like regular beans. I've seen blue, I've seen green, I've seen purple, I've seen red, and ours are orange. And so that's what we're doing. We are coating the seeds with it. Um, my treater here, it works by setting the box of untreated seed on the top. It's on a scale platform as the beans drop down. There's an electronic gate that adjusts to control the flow of the beans. The chemicals are in those tanks and the pumps and they get pumped over here to a mixing valve. Then it goes into our atomizer. There's a little thing that spins around real fast in there and distributes that chemical out real fine mist. The seed flows down through there, down into the auger, mixes, and comes out into the box. The seed is quite wet when it gets in the box. Those are shiny, but it's a pretty small amount of liquid that we're putting on. We're shooting for about six ounces of fluid per hundred pounds. Okay, so um, that is enough to get good coverage, and we add water to get up to that six ounce rate because it's not all chemical at that point. And uh, then those seeds will get set over there next to those boxes. I'll let them set overnight, and they will dry out, and then in the morning we will dump them back into the box that they came out of. Helps break them apart a little bit in case any of them are sticking together. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Generally, the smaller the beans are, the more trouble I have with them sticking. If they're bigger, they tend to break apart on their own pretty easily. So um, that's what we're doing. One other thing that I haven't talked about a lot is um, why I treat them. I can order beans directly from Golden Harvest, already treated, have all the same stuff right on them from the plant. There are several advantages to doing them myself. One, it gives me the opportunity to add other products. I use this pump stand over here to put inoculant on and to put some um, other uh, product called Heads Up on that protects from white mold and SDS. And it lets me customize seed treatments to not only just each individual grower, but each grower's field if they want to. I can give different customer or different treatments based on whatever field you're going to plant your beans in if that's what you want and you want to vary it that much. Um, it also is huge for inventory management. Treated beans can't really be returned. I'm allowed a very small percentage, um, but for the most part, treated beans, once they're in your possession, they're yours. You have to take them. By treating them on demand as needed, I don't have any extra. And the other thing is, Golden Harvest won't let me order any treated beans after like the first of March because they don't want extra treated beans laying around. They don't store for next year, and so they have to pay to dispose of them if they're not planted. Well, this way, by being able to do it myself, I have 10 boxes over there in that corner that are untreated and unsold. If one of my customers or I need a box of beans to finish up in the last part of May or something, it would be very unlikely I could get them from Golden Harvest. Here, all I have to do is throw a box on the treater and treat it, and they're there in a half an hour. And so it gives me that ability to um, manage the inventory and have on hand what I need when I need it. The third big component here is financial incentive, right? I make, I make money treating these beans. I get the margin on that and stuff, and um, it is worth my time to do this. All right. We got our five boxes done. Done treating. That one cake, I didn't quite get it. I mean, there can't be half a gallon left in it, but it didn't 
run empty, so we'll leave it there for now. Those are the other ones that we've already emptied, and we've got one full one yet. So we do have some that we can treat some beans. Happens usually where I get some in-season use or neighboring dealer needs some treated beans. You know, that inventory management thing, it's not just for my dealership, but for uh, the neighboring dealers as well. If they need something in season, they don't have a treater, but I can treat for them where they can't get them treated from the company. So uh, it works out well. All right, it's after five and it's a rainy day. So I'm gonna actually go and uh, try and find one of my seed customers real quick that's sort of local. I had talked to a week ago and just wanted to check in with him again. And uh, then we're probably gonna call it a night. So let's see how much rain we've got. Six tenths, the rain gauge says. On top of three quarters of an inch that we had uh, uh, Saturday night. Sunday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Today is Tuesday, so over the last four days, three and a half days, uh, we've had just about an inch and a half, which is enough. It's wet. It's going to be wet for a few days now. We're, we've, we've got some drying up to do before we'll be able to be back in the fields, but it could be worse. We're not terribly saturated and soaked and flooded and every water sitting everywhere. So um, I expect with no more rain and decent weather, it would take four days before we'd probably be back in the fields there's more rain coming on friday and saturday though so uh it'll be middle or at least the beginning to middle of next week probably and then it looks like things are clearing up that's what it is so anyway uh, i think i'm gonna go ahead and end it here thanks for watching today if you have any questions and comments leave them down below and um we'll probably see you again tomorrow but i don't know what we're gonna do and if it's a slow day i might not make a video i might take a day off from that so take care see ya so I was checking something in my basement here and was looking at something around the water softener. Do you guys want to see a visual representation of why water softeners are important? This just blows my mind. We've been living in this house for about two and a half months now. That's it. Inlet, outlet. Wow, look at how dark that is. That's the rust coating the inside of the pipe. And then the outlet is perfectly clear. Our water is fantastic in this house. Between the water softener and the water filter that we have, like, it's the best water quality I've ever had in my life. But that, and that is after the filter. That's crazy. Crazy.